Chanting the mantra Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva. And he does it for like years. And you see these sadhus in India doing the same thing. You know, the breads grow, the antlers grow, the rest of the mythology, you know. And the whole reason the demon does it is like tapas is like friction, heat, right? Through the power of your practice, you can generate enormous heat. And this demon does it with Lord Shiva. You chant to Shiva because Shiva gets easily pleased. That's why you chant to Shiva. Okay? So this demon chants, Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva. And then Shiva comes up to the demon and he says, Hey, you pleased me. What do you want? The demon said, I want, I want to be immortal. Shiva said, Hey, nobody's truly immortal. Even the gods will have to die one day. Okay? But you will get the next best thing. No existing god or goddess or person can kill you. So the demon said, I'll take it. So this boon Shiva gives, like the blessing, is like the intention coming true. You heard of Dr. Emoto's experiments, right, in Japan? Some of you? Where this Japanese researcher had people meditating in front of water crystals. And if your mind is calm and sattvic, the water crystals are nicely ordered. It's called a smectic, nomadic state. And if your mind is disordered, the water crystals are disordered. It's what is called isotropic state. That was my PhD thesis, by the way. I don't know why I did that. I did that. <laughs> now I'm talking about Durga. Yeah. So this, the, the bottom line is your mind can influence the field around you. The calmness of your persona can influence people around you. Even the word guru, the real meaning of the word guru means the heavy one. Like Jupiter is a heavy planet. Guru in Sanskrit doesn't mean remover of ignorance. It literally means the heavy one because a guru is able to bend space and time around them. Okay, like the heavy objects are literally able to bend space and time. Okay? So Shiva's intention comes true because he's the highest being, so he gives his intention that no existing god or goddess can kill this demon. And this demon gets this siddhi, right? This powers, <coughs> superhuman powers. And Patanjali warns against it, right? In the, there's a whole chapter in the Yoga Sutras on Siddhi Pada. He says, don't be distracted by these superhuman powers. And I have seen it personally. I've seen a yogi meditating in the Himalayas in the snow He's naked and he's sweating mm. because we have these powers within us. I know a guy in Phoenix who does the same thing. He, he sweats in the while meditating in the winter. And this guy actually he he has another siddhi where he knows where the stock is going to turn in the stock market. <laughs> he knows when it's going to bottom out or go up. He just knows before it happens. So he's made like millions, and now he's helping like uh, Buddhist ashrams make money in the stock market. That was a siddhi. But Patanjali warns against it. Don't be distracted by that. Go for that moksha. So this demon gets distracted and now he starts to torture people. People try to fight back. They couldn't fight back. He has a siddhi. Even the gods and goddesses can fight back. And people go to Shiva and say, hey, what have you done? You created a Frankenstein. Save us. Shiva said, I'm too busy meditating on Mount Kailash. Don't bother me. Go bother my wife. <laughs> so they all run to Parvati or Shakti, who is Shiva's wife. And she said, I'll help you. So it's always the men who make a mess of things. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a woman's panel, and the woman come to the rescue, right? The Shakti. So I really feel if the world were ruled by more women, personal opinion, it will be a more peaceful place. Okay? There's more compassionate energy there. So Shakti, she's a beautiful one. I have a statue there. You have a Shakti. And she said, okay, I'll come to your help. And she stands in one place and invites all the gods and goddesses to give their energies to her. And she becomes a new goddess, Durva. So this is an entirely brand new goddess. Okay. 
and she's an amalgamation of everyone. So if you want a deity, that's everyone, that's Durga. And each deity gives the energy to her. Like Kali gives an axe. Kali herself is part of Durga. Hanuman gives the mace, the gada, the club. So Hanuman is like Thor, the superhero. Thor has a hammer, Hanuman has a club. But Hanuman is a lot smarter than Thor. Right, Baba? <laughs> Who gives the lotus? Anyone? Lakshmi, correct? Shiva gives a Trishula. Shiva himself gives a part of himself to her. Vishnu gives a Chakra, the discus. There was a play in Los Angeles called We Live in Vishnu's Dream, as Vishnu dreams. That's the discus, the wheel of samsara. Vishnu gives a conch shell, and Ram gives a bow, and this incredibly beautiful woman. So the face is Parvati, you know? She's very sensuous, very gorgeous, beautiful with a nose ring. And she comes on this fierce tiger. And the tiger represents the Kundalini. You know, it crouches before it pounces like potential. And you can almost picture her coming from the behind that screen. She doesn't come through doors. Yeah? She comes from behind the screen, bobbing up and down on this tiger towards the demon Mahishasura. Yeah? And you can picture like Krishna Das chanting, Hey Ma Durga. Hey Ma Durga. He wants the grand, correct? <laughs> and the demon looks at her and he falls in love. He says, Come, marry me. We will torture the world together. <laughs> yeah? She says, Okay, there was a still moment now. Everything is frozen in time. She's very compassionate. She says, hey, you've done some terrible karmas, okay? You have to pay for what you reap, you sow. Or is it the other way? You reap what you sow or the other way? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. yeah. You plant the seeds and That's harvest. right. So that's the seeds of karma he planted and he has to pay for it. And so the demon becomes a disciple and she compassionately slays him, okay? That's the story. There's a philosophy here. The demon Mahishasura, the buffalo demon, represents the deepest ingrained demonic tendencies within us called samskaras. Right? Who's familiar with samskaras? Okay. Not many. Okay. Let me backtrack. We, have, we all have addictive tendencies. Different levels. I mean, that's part of the human experience. In other words, nobody wakes up in the morning, looks at themselves in the mirror and say, I'm going to do the same stupid thing over again. <laughs> right? But by the end of the day, you end up doing that. Right? <laughs> and why is that? It starts with the vasana. Let's say I come here, there's a beautiful cafe in the street corner there, Cafe 2020. I have that coffee and I like it. So a subtle groove in the mind gets formed. And next time I go by the cafe, it pops up as a desire. It's called a vasana. And I indulge it again, and that groove gets deeper. And I keep doing it, and you keep doing it more and more, it goes to a full-grown samskara. In other words, you don't smoke the cigarette, the cigarette smokes you. Right? That's how these addictive tendencies begin. And let's face it, this is a very addictive-driven society. This, the sales of pharmaceuticals to, the, you know, to this industry is huge. Okay? And you are pretty much powerless against these forces, okay? these demonic tendencies. Even like celebrities are uh, no exception, it's worse. I mean, I've had movie stars come to me. I've had some, you know, the, I, in my opinion, the larger the limelight, the larger the shadow, okay? I mean, you take like politicians. Uh, I mean, I, I know the ex, ex-wife of an attorney general of a major state in America, during the day is a rational decision maker, as at night is a raging alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Because his samskaras get the better of it. An attorney general. You take uh, the politician from New York City, <laughs> Anthony Weiner. Oh. The name itself is a samskara. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> and anyway, the point is, you know, these can be hurt. Okay? They are like, we're all, we have them to different extents. Okay? But here's the main message. 
these samskaras are buried deep in your subconscious. Okay, it's what in Sanskrit is called the karana sharira, your causal body, causal. I cannot, can never say that with an American accent. Baba, just say the word causal loudly. Causal? No, loudly. Causal? Causal. Does that make sense? <laughs> Causes, causal. Thank you. <laughs> They bury in the causal body and your ego is in the mind, right? We talked about the ego, the subtlest aspect of your mind. Your mind is a subtle body and the causal controls the subtle. Okay? It's like the flashlight and the battery. The flashlight is your ego, the battery are the samskaras, the ego tries to look for the samskaras, now it's controlled by them. Okay? Now Durga, as your archetype, Guess where all the archetypes are buried? The collective unconscious, right? According to Carl Jung. That's the causal body. That's how she is able to slay the demon. But here's the main difference between Durga and Kali. She shows love and compassion to the demon. Kali is like, psh, no love, no compassion. Okay? There's a, there was a big study in Portugal. See, we have to have compassion to the, the, the addicts. The, the addictive tendency is one has to, the only way to cure addiction is spirituality and love and compassion. There was a big research study done in Portugal. It had the biggest addiction rates in the world, like hard drugs, heroin, cocaine. And in early 2000, they made a radical decision to make everything legal. Provided people who get these hard drugs get counseled, that there are people who love them and there are friends and family who count on them. And guess what? Now Portugal has the lowest addictive rates in the world. Because at the end of the day, it's love and compassion that helps people through these demonic tendencies. That's Durga. Okay? So she's goodness in a fierce form. Okay? So that's the first three nights. People worship Durga during Navratri because she clears your heart of negative tendencies. Durga is also great for healing in medicine because many of the illness comes from karmas. And if it's weaker karmas, Durga can remove them. But sometimes when the karmas are very strong, it's like swimming upstream, Durga can attenuate the effects of those karmas, but more importantly, she gives you the inner strength. So you can work with them. Okay? So Durga is one of my archetypes. As I said yesterday, mine is Ganesh, Hanuman, and Durga. The next three nights, people worship Lakshmi. But guess what? I'm, you know, I'm already halfway there. <laughs> I've only spoken of Durga. You see what it is? I'm going to run out of time again. I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so Lakshmi is goddess of abundance. And the feng shui corner for abundance is always on the left. So I always put Lakshmi on your face on the left. Kali is Kali here. Now, she is the goddess of abundance and this quality called Shri. S-H-R-I, Shri. Shri is like uh, luminosity. You know, uh, like when you do, uh, when you have a nice yoga session, I look at people's eyes, I see the luminous, you know, the aspect. You see it on the, in the ocean, there's a luminosity. Uh, and that's shown by the lotus. She holds two lotuses on each hand. And a lotus grows in mud. And it's so beautiful. In fact, no mud, no lotus. It actually needs a mud. So she says, within you is Shri. And you know how some people are naturally luminous, the way they talk, the way they do a yoga pose, the way they dress. It's not the physical beauty, even you know, guys have that. It's just a luster. And it can even be a menial job, like cleaning the floor of a toilet. I've seen some people do it with Shri, you know. So that's really what Lakshmi gives you, Shri. That's why her Bija Mantra is Shreem, Om Shreem, Mahalakshmi Namaha. Okay? 
That's why great sages are called Shri, like Shri, Patabi, Joyce, etc. Okay, it's the it's to honor the luminosity. Now let me back up. Have you noticed one thing since yesterday? When I talk about a deity, I make it the best thing ever. Correct? Right. And that really comes from the Puranas, the source text for all these stories and symbolisms are the Puranas where every deity has a Purana, a, a scripture. So you have Lakshmi Purana, you have Shiva Purana, Vishnu, Ganesh Purana. And every Purana makes the deity the highest, as closest to consciousness, as a representation of the formless. And it's really important for us to understand that, okay, you have an archetype or one or more, and you elevate it to the highest, but you don't put the others down. Okay, you don't get all Taliban about it. <laughs> right? So, this whole approach, like somebody asked a question, why are there so many gods? Because we are all different. You know, it's like a buffet. You, eat, you choose what you like. You know, it's like a major in college. We don't all choose the same major. Right? But then, they have deeper meanings. You know, they, they lead you to spiritual awakening. Okay, it's a hero's journey. That's what Joseph Campbell talked about. And ultimately you get the best view in the journey when you're not part of the picture. So we have placed an excessive importance on ourselves as the main character in the hero's journey. But I'm telling you moksha or ultimate freedom or liberation or enlightenment happens when you're not the main character anymore. Okay? So coming back to Lakshmi, with this hand, I wish I had a board so I can write down Sanskrit stuff, maybe next time. Yeah? This hand going down is the blessings hand. It's called Varada Mudra, V-A-R-A-D, the blessings and boons. And the blessing she gives you is of two kinds. She is a goddess of abundance, Kaya. Lakshmi should always please be on the left. That's a functional corner of abundance. I knew you were hiding there. Yeah? It's Kail Baba. He's Hanuman. Just loves to serve. But doesn't like to be acknowledged. That's Hanuman. Yeah? Okay, so this is Varada Mudra, which is number one, material prosperity. The abundance can be of two kinds. One is material which is interesting, she actually wants you to make a lot of money. You know, there are some spiritual traditions which say be poor. That's not what Lakshmi says. Lakshmi says make a lot of money so you can help other people. The energy of money should be moving. It should never be stagnant. Okay, how much, how much are we going to need beyond the basics, you know? And some savings, you know, then we have to help people. That's our dharma, that's our swadharma. And Lakshmi is a classic, uh, like a householder goddess. So she teaches us to engage in society, live like a householder, have a family, and yet be on a yogic path. So sometimes her leg is on the ground, and the leg is up. So the leg on the ground, she says, is be grounded. Don't quit your day job. And the leg up means you can be on a yogic path. Very beautiful archetype. And with the right hand, she removes any fears we have towards abundance, including a fear to receive abundance. Some people have blocks. When she does it, she opens you out. Okay? But then, here's the true abundance she gives you. It's much more than material. She actually gives you spiritual abundance. Spiritual abundance is she has you expand so much and just like the way your left hand never gets jealous of your right hand, what part of one entity, the people around you are so drawn to you that they want to be part of you. In other words, your community become like your family. That's true spiritual abundance. You know? I remember a yoga studio owner in Lake Tahoe, Shaila, she bought this Lakshmi from me two years ago, the same one. And in a month, she like doubled the size of her studio. That's the energy, that's the energy of expansion. That's, that's Mahalakshmi. And it's also interesting, she has like four hands. 
very clearly defined. And each hand represents a phase in a human life. So the Vedas separate the human life into four phases or four goals. Artha, Kama, Dharma and Moksha. Okay. So for instance, this hand is Artha, this hand is Kama, this hand is Dharma. And Artha and Kama, Artha means like uh, you get a good education, you get a good job, make good money, etc. And Kama means fulfilling desires. And Dharma, this hand, is doing things ethically or legally. You don't want to get in trouble, you know, because your mind will be rattled. You won't be able to do your yoga practice. So Artha, Kama, Dharma is a way to engage in the material world. And, uh, you know, get a four bedroom house, two car garage, pick up a dog, right? And for some people, they, they wonder what else is out there. It's like uh, Bill Clinton described his chase to the White House as a dog chasing a pickup truck. Dog keeps running, running and jumps on it and then looks around and says, what else is out there, right? What can I chase? So for the few people who have been there, done that, what Lakshmi gives is this one. This hand is moksha, liberation. So Lakshmi is an amazing goddess. She can address any phase of your life. Okay? And I'm going to talk more about moksha as it pertains to this deal. I know you asked me a question. Then, then yeah, then yeah. So I'm going to talk about that at the end. So that is really moksha. So that's the next three nights. Remember, first three nights Durga, next three nights Lakshmi. Am I going too fast? Are you guys okay? Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Okay, good. The last three nights people worship Saraswati. Okay. Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge, wisdom, intuition, creativity, music, music, and even speech. She's the goddess of speech. Pretty amazing goddess. So, I know some of you are yoga teachers and sometimes it's hard to remember Sanskrit, you know, the word poses, the philosophy. And they say when you, things come out of you fluently, when you're able to articulate it effortlessly, Saraswati dances with the tip of your tongue. Okay, she's a very powerful <coughs> goddess. And it was actually, a, Saraswati is the name of a river in ancient India around which the Vedic civilization existed. So she's like a river goddess. Anything that connotates a flow of intuition, creativity is Saraswati. So there was a story in ancient India. There was this great teacher of the Vedas and he would speak and he'd get like a thousand people attend his lectures. But his son, unfortunately, was not so smart, couldn't understand Sanskrit, couldn't understand the philosophy. The father tried everything, nothing worked. But the son had a good heart. So he once went down to the river behind the house and he meets a woman in distress. You know, she's like uh, clothes were torn, she's hungry, and she's bleeding. And from the goodness of his heart, he brings her home and feeds her, takes care of her. And she was very grateful. So just before leaving, she touches the tip of his tongue. In that instant, a miracle happened. He started to speak eloquently. And he begins to understand the deep philosophy. And he surpasses his dad as a great teacher, who was very <coughs> proud of him. Okay? So Saraswati is amazing for articulation because the woman he met near the river was Saraswati. Okay? And if you look at her iconography, in the right hand she holds a mala, a bead mala, which is circular without beginning or end. You know, a circle has no birth or death. That's awakening. You are beyond this cycle of birth and death. So she says the way to awakening is twofold. One is through the book she holds, that's the Vedas. 
or the tantric agamic scriptures, you know, either one. And that's the path of jnana, the intellect. The other is to the sitar, the veena, that's the heart, the music. Music opens a heart. And she actually recommends the balance, the head and the heart. You don't want only head, you can be intellectually dried out. You don't want only heart, you can be like ungrounded, like some of my friends from Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah? You want a balance. Yeah? And she's a goddess of speech, walk. Speech in Sanskrit is called walk, V A K, walk. Like the word vocal comes from walk. Okay? And the speech is of four, four kinds of speech, actually, four levels of speech mentioned in the Vedas. One is Vaikari Va, which is articulation, like how's the weather, etc. Second is Madhyama Va, an intermediate level, where you contemplate and speak, like a PowerPoint presentation, or many yoga teachers, they plan out a class and teach. The highest she gives you is Pashyanti Va, where things just flow out of you. Pashyanti. Okay, that flow is Saraswati. That's the highest. There's even a higher level called Parava. P -A -R -A, which is a speech of no speech. It's a non-dual state. The state of non-duality. The only thing that exists is consciousness. So here's an example to drill out the examples of speech, okay, the four levels. Imagine all of you a chocolate cake covered with cream. And your mind immediately conjures up that image, right? The saliva might start to flow, like Saraswati does, right? So how does it happen? The word chocolate cream, cake with cream comes out of the subconscious, and that is Pashyanti walk. It just flows out from nowhere. That nowhere is the collective unconscious, okay? We all share that. In Madhyama Vak, the intermediate level is organizing that in my brain to put it in words. And Vaikari Vak is when I articulate, okay, and you are able to visualize it. There is an amazing, you know, way to use speech as a medium to enlightenment. It's a whole field by itself, speech, there's a whole Sanskrit text based on speech, okay. And as somebody who is mainly a storyteller, through the stories I communicate the philosophy, in science there's a concept, especially in neuroscience, there's a concept called neurocoupling. There's a power of storytelling. Like New York Times even had an article a month ago on the power of storytelling. People have gotten jobs. Rather than a resume, they tell a story. You know? It's much better than facts. But here's how it's the most effective. When the audience is in sync with the storyteller, there are some parts of my brain that light up when I share a story. And if you are really in sync, the same parts of your brain light up. Okay? But here's the cool thing, and this is scientific research. When you are totally in sync, Okay? And not like sleeping, etc. Right? The brain lights up before I say it. In other words, you are able to anticipate what I am going to say. It's pretty remarkable. Studies have shown this. Okay? That's the power of storytelling. So, like some of you might do like Shavasana, right? And there's a tendency to sleep. So my suggestion is if you you know if you want to be alert during Shavasana, you do Shavasana with your hand this way. So when you nod to sleep, it just wakes you up. <laughs> What's your question? Somebody had a question. I did, but I, I answered my own question. Good. Let's move on. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So we talked about uh, Durga. Right? Yeah. The goddess who means well with love and compassion, but she's not too politically correct. You know, she chops the demon's head off, right? 
And then we talked about Lakshmi. In the last three nights, people worship Saraswati because she gives you knowledge, okay, the wisdom, because you are ready, you know. And she is also the goddess of music. Many musicians love Saraswati. Okay? Now, I don't want to forget our Buddhist friends, so <coughs> partly to honor you, Baba. Where is the Buddhist Baba? There you are. <laughs> Yeah, I know he gave a fantastic answer yesterday. The difference between Hinduism and Buddhism, right? And I gave a vernacular reply, Hinduism tastes great, Buddhism is less filling. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but really, there's an amazing concept in Buddhism about love and compassion. And I've been to Buddhist retreat, I learned from the Buddhist masters. It's what is called the Avalokiteshvara, you know? So, the traditional archetype of Buddha is somebody, you know, the metaphor of a spiritual path is somebody who goes up the mountain, retreats from society and meditates and realizes the self. So, the word Buddha in our tradition would mean the buddhi, his intellect, got awakened to the source. So the closest thing in our mind to consciousness is the buddhi. Remember I gave that example of the fire. The ego is a fictitious entity. It doesn't really exist. We made it up. It's a, it's a set of images. To, we think it's who we are. And the ego is very natural. It builds around the age of two. Okay. And the Buddha means is buddhi has awakened to the source and that's how you would chant the Gayatri Mantra. Right? Some of you know that. Om Bhur Bhuvasuvaha Tatsavitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodaya The Dhi comes from Buddhi. So the mantra basically says, let the light of all lights. So let the light is not like this light. It is light in which the presence of which everything is known. It is the light of awareness, the light of knowledge. So they let, let the light of all lights awaken our buddhi, awaken our intellect to the source. In other words, may we all become buddhas. Okay? So Buddha got enlightened and he will not reincarnate. There is only one Buddha, Prince Siddhartha. The Buddhas you see like the Hotai Buddha, the happy Buddha with the belly, that is a saint, sage Hotai. But there is still like suffering in the world. So his feminine aspect, the Avalokiteshvara, and Hindus, by the way, call him Lokeshwar. There's a link between Hinduism and Buddhism in Avalokiteshvara. It's like Brahma, Lokeshwara, Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara sheds tears at the suffering. So they decide to do something about it, and they descend down the mountain as bodhisattvas, a living liberated, and they help people. Okay? They are great healers. They are great people in service. People who, pretty amazing people who, you know, who are called to serve. And that, that's the, these two statues. The Thara. The Thara archetype. Okay? She is the goddess of compassion, healing, protector of children, protector of animals. See, you cannot teach spirituality to somebody who is hurting, be it physically or emotionally. You have to address people where they are, you know. So, great figures throughout history who, who have helped unconditionally, such as Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, they are great archetypes of the Tara, I feel. Okay, serving unconditionally. There's a very beautiful practice, I went to a retreat where a Buddhist practice where you view every person as your mother. And that's where the love and compassion should come out, you know. And this is the white para. And that's the green para. And I'll explain the difference. So the white para is the goddess of compassion and healing, but she also says, hey, build up the inner strength. Okay? Wear the oxygen mask first. There's people I meet who are in a rush to help other people, but they kind of a little 
loose, you know. They're not too, they're not too tight inside, you know. I'll give an example. I was teaching in a nine, ten years ago. I was in a New York City in a studio. I taught a workshop in Manhattan at a studio called Some Like It Hot Yoga. <laughs> yeah. Anyone from New York? Yeah, it was a famous studio. It came on TV and all that. And about 10 years ago, I know the owner well. And she was actually an orphan from England, Yola, very beautiful woman. And I'm teaching a workshop like this, like for a couple days. And in the middle of the workshop, she starts to like bawl, like cry, like literally bawl, you know? She's like, whoa, what's going on? And then all her staff starts to cry. And I'm thinking maybe I've, you know, I said something and I'm inappropriate, you know. Sometimes I do that. Yeah? And then it struck me, hey, they were releasing stuff because in New York there's a lot of aggressive energy. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be like aggressive. Uh, women, everyone has to be aggressive. So they're tough on the outside but soft inside. Whereas on the healing and spiritual path, you have to be soft outside. So you can accept different people, but tight inside, so things don't bother you. You wear the oxygen mask first. That's what the white Tara is. She helps you gain strength, so you can help people more and more. The legs are folded. You see the legs? And this is the green Tara, where the legs is outstretched. And they both do this mudra. See this mudra? Yeah, this is the Jnana Mudra. So, the great Bodhisattvas such as Thara, they help people. And finally, in the Buddhist tradition, you know, they help them cross the ocean of samsara, which is enlightenment, awakening. So, in, in our tradition, this is called the Jnana Mudra, the highest mudra before enlightenment. The forefinger touches the thumb, and the forefinger represents your ego, your individuality, right? You say it's your fault or I'm great, we do this. The mm. thumb metaphorically represents the self, the universal self. We use the thumb for everything, writing, lifting, even texting, yeah? So it represents the universal self, which is always needed. Physiologists know these four fingers are powerless without the thumb. So ego makes the self form the perfect circle. And there is no beginning or end. You've gone out of this cycle of karma, good and bad karma, okay? And what the ego leaves behind are three aspects associated with the ego, body, mind, and intellect. So this is shifting your identification from who we think we are, this body, mind, to unlimited consciousness. That's the Jnana Mudra. That's what these great deities do, okay? Now I'm gonna switch gears to the Hindu tradition let me check the time. One of the biggest misconceptions people have is that Hinduism is a religion. And even the Indians are born into it. The word Hindu actually never existed in the Vedas. The, the word Hinduism never existed in the Vedas. In fact, the word Hindu actually came around 1730. And it's always the fault of the British, right? You blame everything on <laughs> the British. Because there's a difference between a religious belief and a spiritual experience. Okay, uh, a belief is belief. It's based on your religion, you know, we talked about it. It depends on the family you grow up, the country you, you're born into. You know, if you're in Saudi Arabia, you'll be talking something else, right? So religion is like, uh, you know, largely an accident of birth. Whereas a spiritual experience is more sort of universal. We all share some similar things. Like, uh, you know, you know what you dream, that's a spiritual experience. You know what you meditate. This life can be a spiritual experience. The awareness of just being happy. <coughs> that's a spiritual experience. These are all experiences. These are universal. There's no religion here. And the Indian tradition, the ancient yogi tradition, has always been about spiritual experiences. And it is always usually about realizing the self, the deity, the God within. And it's never been a religion. 
And the British came to India around, you know, 16, 1700s. And they find the Indians engaged in different spiritual practices. Some are doing Hatha Yoga, some are doing Pranayama, some are chanting, some Tantrikas were smoking dope, ganja, you know, and thinking of Shiva. You get the best ganja in Shiva temples, by the way, even now. It's always, it's always been legal. So imagine the British mind, you know, they used to like a very monotheistic approach. They come in here and they see all this crazy stuff. So they say, not quite cricket, right? <laughs> so at that time, the people of the Indus Valley River were called Hindus by the Persian traders. So the word Hindu was strictly a geographical connotation. There was nothing religious about it. And the British latched onto it and made it a religion. And they made it Hinduism. And even the Indians have bought into it. You know, most Indians really don't know that Hinduism is not a religion. You know, it's a set of spiritual practices. That's why Hinduism accepts all religions. You know, Jesus Christ to us is a God also. I like Stephen Covey's joke. Anyone heard that? All religions, all paths are good as long as they all lead to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love Bill Maher too. He's an amazing atheist. Even atheism is accepted in the Hindu tradition. I mean, any God is accepted. Bring him on. Everyone is God. Okay, it's as simple as that. The only thing there is, is the divine. It's only God, that's it. So it's a very different outlook on the whole thing. Okay? And I don't know how I got into this digression. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it. <laughs> so I'm switching from Buddhist to Hindu. Okay? And I'll ask you another quiz question. If Buddhism started in India, right? Buddha was a Hindu, Prince Siddhartha. Why isn't Buddhism a predominant religion in India right now? I'm using the word religion, quote unquote. But there are very few Buddhist practitioners in India. Okay? I always ask this to many academicians. I pick their brains. Yes. Are you asking a question or answering my question? Oh, answering. Thank you. What's your name? <laughs> She's the only one who's answered it. She said Shankaracharya. So here's the deal. Uh, this, that's our tradition. That's the Advaita Vedanta tradition. Shankaracharya around the, you know, 700, 800 AD. Like Buddhism was the main deal in India, okay, at one point. But India has always had a healthy uh, debates, you know. Debates were all encouraged. And all religions are there. India accepts, there's a lot of Jewish population in India, Zoroastrians, Muslim. Muslim is like, a, you know, a lot of, you know, it's big, 10% of the population is Muslim. Everyone is, you know, accepted in India. But the non-dual philosophy of Advaita Vedanta, they used to have debates those days. And one of the reasons was Shankaracharya, I wouldn't say the word defeat is a strong word, but he overcame many of the Buddhist philosophers. Okay? And the rule those days was the Buddhist, the person who loses the debate becomes the disciple. Okay? That's one of the reasons there's hardly any Buddhists in India. The other reason is when the Muslims invaded around the 10th, 11th century, the, the, Hindu, the Buddhist tradition was they used to all congregate in monasteries, you know, the monks. And it was fairly easy for the Islamic invaders to kind of kill all of them in one spot. Whereas the Hindu tradition is more sort of decentralized. So everyone had their deity, you know. When you have your deity, your home becomes an ashram. That's what you're doing. Okay, each of us have, has an ashram, right? So it's very hard to kill the entire population. So that's another theory. And then, you know, I've had long discussions with academics. I've had discussions with Buddhist scholars and... Uh, 
there's no one universal answer, but that's the one I happen to subscribe to. Okay, well, thank you. So in the Hindu tradition, there is something very unique, and it's also there in the Christian tradition, a very beautiful black, black congregational churches is a concept of bhakti. Okay, this is Krishna Radha. This is the archetype of the highest relationship. It's a relationship archetype. That's why the Buddhist Baba I suggested Krishna Radha. When it comes to an archetype, an archetype is, you have an archetype of where you are, but there's another archetype of where you want to be. You want to always extend yourself, you want to stretch yourself a bit, okay? So like my last job was a GE, my last corporate job. And you know, we had this concept about stretching yourself always. Okay? And uh, this is the archetype of the highest relationship of love. Okay? So many relationships are based on chemistry of body and mind, right? Compatibility. But what happens is body and mind changes with time and sometimes one partner doesn't honor the other on their evolution. People change. We are not going to be the same person. Okay? We are all evolving. And if one partner doesn't honor the other on their whatever changes have happened, sometimes relationships break. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's an issue. Here with Krishna Radha, the relationship is based on seeing the one spirit in each other. You seeing the one spirit in each other as Shri Krishna. The word Krishna is the attractive nature of spirit. There's something compelling, it's not impersonal. There's something very deeply attractive. Okay? And when it's based on seeing the one spirit in each other, it's valid not only this lifetime but all lifetimes. So when you go to India and Vrindavan where Krishna grew up with the stories, I went there, I'm a guy and they're all calling me Radha. Radha Radha. Radhe Radhe. And it's strange, you know, I'm wondering. Then the realization dawns that we are all Radhas, wanting to immerse us, immerse ourselves in the bliss of love with Sri Krishna. And the Krishna is a very, very beautiful archetype of love. I'll give an example. Let's say we're right, right on the beach. So imagine there's all this woman in the front row. The whole row is woman, right here. Imagine the chairs are turned and they're sitting enjoying the ocean. And suddenly they see a, a guy walk by, a TDH. Anyone know what a TDH is? Tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> That's Krishna. And there's something very magnetic about him. You don't know what it is, but like you can't help but keep your eyes on him. You have to like look at him. Everything is like dropping, right? And he walks by you and you have to get up and follow him. You just have to. You don't have a choice. There's a magnetism. The word Krishna is like the blueness of the sky, the thunder. It's so blue and rich and compelling. And then everyone's like the whole beach is following Krishna. Yeah, all the gopis, all the women. And then Krishna stands in one spot and he does this. And he plays the flute. And then everyone dances around him, all the gopis. And they all want him. So what he does is he replicates himself 16,108 times. Yeah, there's a beautiful story in the Bhagavatam. So everyone gets a Krishna. And it's the path of love. It's the path of devotion. And this path of devotion, that's your archetype Baba, Lord Krishna. Yeah? And look at his eyes, he's, he's feeling the bhav. <laughs> this is called the bhav, he's in the bhav. Yeah? Krishna cracked open my heart. So when Krishna does this, and gopis are in a circle, it's the path of highest communion with Lord Krishna. The beautiful metaphor here is Shiva. See, the right foot is always important, so Krishna does this. What does Shiva do with the right foot? He steps down on ignorance. And that's the path of Jnana, which says, your true nature is God. Whereas the path of devotion says, you merge with God. 
and Krishna does this and you have gopis in a circle. Shiva dances with a foot on a pasmara and you have a circle of flames. Guess what? It's just, at, the, at the end, both the paths merge. The path of jnana and bhakti. You merge with God or you realize your true nature is God. Heads up and tails you lose. <laughs> Very beautiful tradition. The bhakti, in my opinion, is the hardest thing to teach in the West. You can only, you know, experience that. When your heart is cracked, your knowledge gets to be amazing. I'll give an example. That's really what happened to me. About 10 years ago, I was in New York City attending a conference. And a guy walks up to me. He was a guru in the Krishna tradition, like from South America. But he was an offshoot of the Hare Krishna. And he buys a Krishna from me. And you know, some of his disciples came and told me, hey, you should go to his kirtan. So I went you know, that evening. And he was up on the stage, and everyone was on the floor chanting the Maha Mantra. Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. And there was a whole crowd, and the tempo started to build up. And when people were doing the dolak, you know, the percussion. And the energy is building up more and more and more and more. At the very climax, people are like going, you know, they were all in the bhav, you know. But what this guru did was he just looked up and he did this. In that moment, I felt like a ripping motion in my heart. And I'm a pretty grounded guy, you know, but I felt my heart ripped. It just ripped. And I started to like sob uncontrollably. Because Krishna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very ignorant of the, all of this knowledge you're sharing with us today. And in particular, you know, I heard about Rama and Krishna. I really don't know what Rama yeah, is. Yeah, they are aspects of Vishnu. Okay. So and when you see pictures, they're usually blue with mm -hmm. yellow clothes. Right. Blue is an avatar. It's an infinite mm -hmm. discernment to the finite. And yellow means you take some silica. Hold it to the fire, it turns yellow. Okay. So it's an infinite descending to the finite. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.